Thanks everybody for coming. And some of you, just a couple of you have to be here, I think, right? Because this is your class. Um, yeah, so my name is Steve Dohler and I'm a professor in industrial design. And um, I've been uh, appointed as the lead for a, our uh, creative entrepreneurial uh, initiative that we have inside ADAPT. And um, it's a really um, interesting program that we have, and it's, it's really kind of an organic thing that's going across all of DAP. And what we're trying to do is um, make students aware that there are other ways um, besides going and working for someone to have a career. And that goes through all the di disciplines inside of DAP. Um, we have um, started this about, let's see, last summer we we had our first uh lecture uh series and uh, we've done one every semester and we're going to do one every semester for as long as we can and it's going to focus around different areas of entrepreneurialism and th inside the creative fields um and tonight we're go going to be looking at art um another exciting thing that's happened is that we've started to um develop entrepreneurial co-ops. So we've got some funding for paid co-ops for um, artists, designers, architects, and planners that may want to uh, try their own thing for a semester as part of a co-op. And the last thing is that we just secured last week a physical space down by uh, Finley Market at 24 Elder Street. And um, so this is going to be a place where students can bring in uh, their work to, to be sold and make, have uh, produce shows for you know, more than a week, a month or so, and um, a place for us to really show, showcase um, our creativity and also launch some ideas, launch some ventures that you may wanna do. So um, that's all happening uh, as we speak. So, um, uh, you know, I just wanted to make you all aware of that. So if you see any other posters around for creative entrepreneurialism, it's for you all. And um, it's for everyone inside ADAPT. Um, so tonight, um, we've got some pretty exciting guest speakers that come to us uh, from their own private work and from artworks. And um, Jenny. Eustick is going to moderate this, uh, this event. And uh, Jenny, if you don't know, is, uh, um, she works a lot in foundations here and um, is an international recognized muralist. And um, we're really lucky to have her and she is going to be our moderator for this evening. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I just want to say a few words. Um, I, I love artworks. I have a long history with artworks and um, got my first start with them in 2003 at the same time I started my graduate study. So teaching and making public art have always been linked and parallel for me. Um, thanks to the experience that I got with artworks, painting murals from 2008 to 2017, um, I gained incredible skills and met uh, a, an ever-expanding network of other artists and um, people with other skills. Maybe they don't put uh, paint on the wall, but they make it happen. They make it run as part of a larger team. So it really laid the groundwork for me um, to appreciate how this kind of work is made possible. And uh, I'm you know, super excited to, to keep in touch with Artworks and see how their programming has changed and expanded and grown and adapted to the realities and the desires of the people involved in this life that we live together. So um, I'm gonna read a little bit about each of our panelists and then I'm gonna just give them um, the floor and I really wanna hear from them. So first we have Evan Hildebrand a uh, multidisciplinary artist specializing in mixed media applications, large scale murals, no surprise, um, and unique art installations. He's completed dozens of large scale art projects including murals and 3D art constructions and has been full-time artist since 2008. He has a studio in downtown Cincinnati where he's a prolific, uh, he's prolific in creating his artwork. He's worked with many clients and interior designers to create site-specific work over his career. 
He completed five large-scale murals for artworks before joining as their mural studio manager, which you'll hear all about. Cameron Lee is a professional, I'm sorry, a passionate and versatile force in cinematography, creative direction, media strategy, and photography. As a chief designer and solutionist at his co-founded design agency, he is responsible for high-level creative decisions and overseeing the design and development of creative assets, including advertisements, products, events, or logos. With a degree in film and cinema from the Los Angeles Film School, Cameron gained fundamental skills in film direction, camera operation, photo shoots, and art direction. He's hands-on experience leading teams on film sets and has directed music videos, photo shoots, and modeling and styling. Cameron is now Artworks first ever, this is really awesome, uh, photography and videography studio manager. Niall Adi has gravitated to the business of the arts, the business of the arts, her entire life. After initially pursuing a career in fashion marketing, she started her own styling business at 21, styling photo shoots, fashion shows, and personal wardrobes. Her photo shoot styling led her to this, the world of small business retail management, where she won Best of Denver Awards in 2019 and 2022 for her work with Velvet Wolf Boutique and Wish Gifts. Her creative inter interests are heavily rooted in music, um, in the music world, and after managing and promoting local bands in Denver, Niall co-founded Rock and Doe's, a homestay and rental brokerage serving touring musicians. She now serves as Artworks Social Enterprise Manager, helping the worlds of art and enterprise intersect in new and beautiful ways. So now I'm going to turn it over to our guests. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Yes, excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we got together about a week ago and had a wonderful conversation, and I think um, it would be great to hear each of you just give a little bit of your background, expand on some of the bio points if you want to, uh, tell your story of how you got to now and really what keeps going for you and what keeps you going. So, yeah, my name is Evan Hildebrandt. Um, I'm a self-taught artist. I've been making art uh, I think about 25 years, for about 25 years now, it's kind of hard to believe that because it goes by really quick. Um, I, 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 I quit a full-time job in 2008 to, be, to become a full-time artist, um, right at the time of the uh, economic collapse in 2008. So um, a lot of lessons to be learned. I'm hoping to share that a little bit later on um, when you do decide to go all in when it comes to you know, being an artist. Um, just over the years, I, I always, I told myself I need to um, know the rules in order to break them. So I kind of taught myself how to be like a more of a photorealistic oil painter. And then from there I went on to, I started doing abstract work. Uh, I got my first mural in 2010 with um, artworks because of my portfolio of doing the photorealistic art. And I've done, I can't remember, I said five, but I think I've done many more than that, uh, led many more than that murals uh, around, around the city. Um, on and off, I've been able to be full-time artist, but then sometimes I've had to get part-time jobs and, and go back and forth. Uh, you know, my ultimate goal is always to be a full-time artist and to realize my own, my own work, my own, my own imagery, images and my own work. Um, so I've dabbled in everything from murals, oil paintings to um, even uh, resin sculptures and mixed media, um, large-scale a lot of different weird projects. Last year I made a, uh, a hang glider for um, the Red Bull Flugtog, um, where they <laughs> dive off into the Ohio River. So I've done some really interesting things, so. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Cameron Lee. I am originally born in Columbus, Ohio, but I'm a transplant to Cincinnati via Los Angeles. Um, I mean, that was a great explanation of, of what I've done. Um, I graduated from Los Angeles Film School, spent a lot of time working in the film industry for a good few years or so from feature films on down to short films and commercials and music videos. Um, my passion was in photography, analog, 35 millimeter medium format, um, and that's really what drove me into filmmaking. As a bartender, that's what got me um, kind of out there in Los Angeles and I got plucked out of the bar to do a photo shoot for 
uh, creative director, and one thing led to another, um, which led me to styling and doing wardrobe for some major recording artists at the time. Um, so I kind of pivoted from the film industry to working in fashion. And that let me do another course of another few years, which was awesome. Traveling the United States with these artists was, was a pretty dope endeavor. Um, and then, uh, yeah, spent a lot of the next few years or so being a Crave director, freelance in my photography and um, being a designer. And then I met uh, my partner and she is an illustrator animator. So we decided to team up and start a business together um, and did that and moved to Cincinnati during the pandemic. And the rest has been history, really. I've been two year, two and a half years into uh, our design agency. We do a few other things around Cincinnati. We run a flea market that we host once a month um, in the city. Um, I am now the photo and video studio manager at Artworks, which I am proud to be in. Um, and I'm excited to take on this position that they're offering this, this new studio, a new opportunity uh, for students, young adults, um, to fulfill their careers in a photography, videography, filmmaking aspect, um, which we don't get too much opportunities, uh, I feel like, here in Ohio. So, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Hi, everybody. I'm Niall Adi. Um, I have, like the bio said, always been drawn to the business part of arts. I have felt passion about art, music, fashion my entire life, but didn't feel like I was the talent. Not that I'm not talented, but I also didn't want to be the one center stage. I kind of wanted to be the one backstage, moving things forward, um, taking people's dreams and turning them into reality. So that's kind of what I've been focused on my entire you know, professional career. I now, as the social enterprise manager at artworks get to interface with anyone interested to be a partner with us and you know take all the information they have distill it into a brief and then get it to the right studio or right program um, I feel super passionate about that it feels like the job was created just for me I love it it also goes hand in hand with what I've done with bands with other artists with um, you know my styling career with modeling all of that so I'm excited to talk to you all about my experience so I would love to just briefly um, have you talk about what it's like to bring your entire you know life of experience and your own sensibilities into the artworks bubble, right? Um, bubble sounds you know like it's hermetically sealed, but it's a very expansive and porous <laughs> environment. But to be these independent, experienced, um, and driven creatives and connectors. Um, can you talk about how that dovetails with what Artworks does and a little bit about your day to day? Sure, so um, I, I am the mural studio manager. So typically with Artworks, historically they've done murals in the summertime seasonal where they have uh, 14 to 18 year old artists working on large scale, scale murals. They've gotten so much uh, inquiries into other, other murals, smaller ones, that they decided to um, have a, have a year-round studio. And so I was asked last um, August to, to, for this job, and I said, yes, this is the perfect job for me. I love uh, working with, with young artists to, to just help them see their career through and maybe see a path. And so I feel like for, for me, um, yeah, so what, how does it dovetail? I think... I think the biggest thing for me is, like, again, even though there is a financial aspect, we have to make these murals um, in order to just have the program in general. You know, I, I, I personally think for, for myself, equal to that, I love helping and seeing some of these younger artists um, see their vision through. So I, I am very blessed to be able to, you know, talk to um, the artists that I have working uh, underneath me and to ask them about their own personal work, see where they want to go, try to just give them any, any bit of knowledge that, that I have that I, that I can give. I feel like I'm just, I, I want to give as much as I possibly can at this time. And um, yeah, so for, for me, just to see them thrive and to see them get, get over some of their um, mental gymnastics. I know all of you as artists understand that there's a lot of mental gymnastics that we have to go through, ups and downs of, am I good enough? Am I, am I crazy? <laughs> you know, all these types of things. Well, I've been on that roller coaster and have, I feel like have 
overcome a lot of those hurdles. And so now it's time for me to help um, some some other artists. I, I don't just help younger artists. I help anybody. But uh, the, the younger artists underneath me that I'm working with, I love to just help them try to navigate this crazy space we call the art world. Yeah, I would say, um, I think I had a pretty unique experience in that I, I did go to school, but it was really tailored towards a specific goal and a, and a particular career path that also allowed me to be in a city where I could see what else was out there. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to leave Ohio really young. Um, I moved to Los Angeles when I was just 19 um, and was kind of out there figuring it out. And I was to that advantage was allowing me to kind of see what was going on in Los Angeles, but also see if it is something that I wanted to go to school, experience school. Again, I should say, because I tried school the first time, went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for a semester, hated it, moved back home and wasn't too sure about school at all. So um I got a chance to figure it out, and in that time, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my passions, um, and which kind of helped me expand the things that I could see myself doing for the rest of my life. Um, so while I was focused on film, uh, I was able to do a lot of other things that kept me moving and, and kept me motivated. And I just really want to use this opportunity with artworks, that it being a new studio and a completely new opportunity um, as that for young artists as well who may not get a chance to fly across the country and live in a new city and experience new things the way I was able to. Um, but if I can create that type of an environment here um, through artworks and through my studio, uh, then uh, that's really the goal. And that's my, my, uh, my number one objective with being the studio video manager. Perfect. Um, we're so glad to have you in Cincinnati. Um, you know, and it, I'm so excited to see what happens with the studio. Um, everyone knows artworks for the murals, right? But uh, it's so, so much more than that. And being a bridge between desire and ambition and getting the hard skills to actually launch um, as an independent creative, that's what I see you providing, and it's so valuable. And Niall, you've talked about um, how you've supported creatives along the way. And I, we talked about this before, but I would love to hear you describe maybe some pitfalls that you've seen in some of the artists or groups that you've worked with. The, the drive is there, the ambition is there, uh, but it's really difficult being out on your own and being the, the sort of sole propri proprietor of a business. Talk about some of the um, advice that you've had to give. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, I've had to give a lot of that advice, but I'm happy to do it and happy to be that voice of reason sometimes. A lot of times while working with creatives in all fields, you know, there is that drive, there's that passion, there's that, you know, the personal aspect of it. It's your talent, it's your craft. So sometimes you can't see where you're maybe missing some things or you can't see where there's opportunities. Um, so I've had to go in there and kind of help shape realistic expectations um, and kind of harness that drive and that passion and say, you know, you're so talented at X, Y, and Z, not so much at these other se sections. Let's focus on that and let's, you know, for example, bookkeeping, that can be a little hard, um, recording money, you know, I'll come in and be like, okay, are you established as an LLC, as an official business? Do you have an official bank account for this? You know, do you have schedules? Do you have goals? Let's like get it all on paper. So. I feel like that is a big part of what I've done in my experience and also just kind of helping people that have these skills and talents, you know, really get things focused and start having that ambition with clear goals and clear things that they can target and hit and track their progress. Evan, I'd like to hear you talk about the decision in 2008 or around then, the lead up to deciding to be a full-time artist and what, how you understood that to be defined. What did it mean to be a full-time artist and what were you leaving behind and how did that feel? 
Sure, sure. So I was uh, working at you know, Toyota over in Hebron, Hebron, Kentucky. Just I was I was stocking parts, but I I did make really good money um, at the time when I was there, and I had started making making art several years before that. And I honestly got obsessed. I mean, I was the type where I would um, work all day and then come home all night and just make art every single day. So I, I was just, I've been ever since then very prolific in my, in my art making. Um, I just can't stop. And so I still remember the time though where I just was like, I, I really didn't want to go to work. I really had a lot of ideas to come out. And I remember being in the aisle of one of at Toyota and thinking, what is happening? Like sort of starting to have a little bit of a kind of a breakdown. Like, um, I can't believe I've been given this gift, which I, it, it is a gift to be creative, a, a challenging gift, but it's a gift nonetheless, a very, a gift that's needed in this world. But I thought, wow, what is going on? And, you know, for, for me, I do have a spiritual path that I'm on. And um, I, I, I really heard in my mind, just chill out, you know. Um, uh, wait, this, was, this was in August. And um, I, heard, I heard a voice very distinctly say, say to me, and I believe it was from God, say, uh, get, get this series of work done that, you want, that you're working on right now. It's a, it was a black and white oil painting series. And wait till May. And I thought, what in the world? But, it, but I had a sense of peace about me. So as I went on about October, I threw my back out from that job and I was off, off work for a while and I told myself, well, I'm just going to wait till the doctor tells me to go back to work. And during that time, I was able to then um, start to paint again. So I, I was strong enough to be able to paint and lo and behold, I finished my black and white series and May came around, the doctor told me to go back to work, and we decided not to go, not to go back to work. Now, um, so that's, that, was, that was the path that I was on. Um, in, in hindsight, I would have done some things differently. I don't know if we should, if one would speak about this. I mean, I don't think, you know, if, you're, if, if you do decide to quit your job, there are, you know, I, I know that artists can be very impulsive, and, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing in many ways. <laughs> There are also lessons to learn from being impulsive, and and so um, you know if I in, in hindsight I definitely would have had you know at least some sort of uh, mon monetary like uh, uh, stash of money to to hold me over um, at that at that point, and I'll talk about some of this later. I think in the questions, I really didn't understand the ins and outs of the art world at all. I was just in my studio. I had a passion. And I didn't really understand like what it was to show work, to be in the gallery scene, to um, make a name for yourself, kind of create a brand, all those things. And, um, it, and, and then I, it was also that during the um, economic ep economic crash of 2008 is when I did that. Now I always I always say I never missed a payment on my house payment. I had a mortgage. I never missed a payment. So um, it is possible, but there was pain pain points as well. Definitely hustling, right? Awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm, I am kind of, I'm going into these things that we've discussed. Um, we had this fantastic conversation, so I'm going to try and pull out as much as, of that as I can. Cameron, I'd like to have you talk about the, uh, you know, the path that you took initially in Pittsburgh, then Los Angeles. Um, there was this way that you described a level of focus that you had when you were really in earnest um, committing to earning this degree and getting this experience, um, sort of uh, differentiating yourself from how you were in high school going forward and, and how you mustered the focus and the drive. Yeah, yeah I, um, I mean, I feel like you know you have that drive early on. Um, I mean, I, I think it's something that can be taught as well. I mean, you can you can teach someone to to kind of be passionate and, and have drive and, and motivation and all those words, but like the feeling that it is to to like be driven, um, I feel like you just know that inside of you. Um, and I think for me, one, I'm an only child, and so it was I always had to create everything so i mean it's, i think that's also why i'm an, uh, an artist as well i mean it's an imagination it's it's talking to yourself it's 
you know, like, you know, and entertaining yourself, you know, as, as, as far as you can. So I think that's what kind of helped push the, the motivation towards never stopping. Um, and, and then my father was just one of those people who never let me stop or quit. It was like, if you're going to do something, go all the way. And when you finish it, finish it and you can move on to the next thing. And I think that's having that mentality is like, okay, well, I have to get through it. So the best way to get through it, I don't, I don't never want to look bad. So like, I don't, I'm not going to like halfway go through it. Even if I don't like it, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. So I'm going to research as much as I can. I'm going to practice as much as I can. I'm going to, you know, utilize those skills as much as I can until I find an end point on an accomplishment. And then I'm able to move on to the next thing. And so I think having that type of mindset has just allowed me to complete something and move on to the next thing if I feel like it's something that didn't suit me or keep pushing forward in something that I did feel passionate about and, you know, take myself to the next level and to the next level. So yeah. That's excellent. And what I'm hearing is, you know, you had good guidance, but also someone holding you accountable uh, oh, so for many your people. actions. Yeah, yeah right. So, many, so people. many people and so many consequences, right? And um, and then I also hear this process of self reflection, and just let's let's evaluate, let's let's see how I feel about what I've done, and use that going forward. Um, it sounds like incredibly healthy. <laughs> Has to be. Yep. Um, Niall, so I want to talk about. Again, sort of thinking about um, independent creatives launching or sustaining a career or a business and um, maybe coming up against a realization that they can't do it all themselves. And you've talked about some of the uh, specific business aspects, finance, taxes, things like that. But can you talk about the element of community and realizing how you fit into a bigger picture? could talk about this all day. Um, it is so important to find your people, to find your community, to establish partnerships that aren't just contracts, black and white signed. I mean, a partnership is having someone who supports you, who brings your name up in rooms that you're not in, who suggests you for projects that they can't take on. It is so important to have those people, to have people to hold you accountable. You know, that's a lot of times where I would come in and be like, okay, I asked you to produce this many things by this time and you didn't do it and these consequences you know, maybe you're not booking the show that we talked about maybe you're not getting that client that we had talked about and I think you know it's just just because you're doing it for you doesn't mean it has to be all you you know entrepreneurship does not exist without partnerships and without community and it is so important to invest in others you know if you want people to come to your show you better be going to other shows you better be talking and supporting other creatives and you know forging those relationships that can you know, turn out to be really, really beneficial for you in the future. So, um, Evan, maybe now's a good time to talk about uh, how you actually filled in some knowledge gaps about how the art world works, um, just sort of revealing your, your sources of, of yeah. you know, the map. What's the map for you? Sure. So, um, <laughs> I want to I want to caveat anything this that by saying that you know everything's possible right it's not um, but there are some hard truths about the art world that you have to understand and so when you when I got out into the art world like I said um, you know most of us have this idea where we're going to be in the studio and somebody's going to come in and buy a little work and they're gonna be like oh it's uh, you're amazing you're amazing well that doesn't happen usually. I mean, it, it might, but it's pretty, it's pretty rare. And so um, w one of the things is, I, I, you know, I, be I believe self-awareness is a huge thing. And what I mean by that is, um, so I've been reading this book. I think everyone should get it, in my opinion. I've, I haven't finished it yet, but it's very good. Just what I've read. It's everything for art. Um, I, can, I, I can't remember. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, you can get it on Amazon. It's very easy to find. Everything for art. Um, and what, when, when I'm reading that, I'm, I'm seeing it very, very clearly what, what they're saying, and I've seen it in my, in my understanding of the art world. I'm not saying I'm an expert either, but there are lanes um, in the art world, okay? Um, these lanes, and there's no rules a lot of times too, or, or, or they're very, uh, it's not like a normal, a normal, 
you're not selling like a, a, a heater to somebody or a rug, you're selling a luxury item. So that's the first thing you have to understand. You're selling a luxury item to, to the world. What I mean by lanes is there are like blue chip galleries. There are um, galleries underneath that. There are different levels of galleries. There are, um, you know, art fairs you can sell at. There's, you know, Etsy, people sell on Etsy. Um, there are um, museum routes. Uh, some, some, some artists go towards the museum route. Some, some artists go towards a conceptual route. Well, each one of those routes has a very different path to go on, okay? And if you're not self-aware enough to recognize the type of work you're making, the type of work that you're drawn to, specifically that you're making, um, you may be on a route that is not ever going to get you to where you want to be. So if you want to go on a museum route, for example, you really have to start, you know, you have to be in um, publications. Uh, you have to maybe, you know, take on residencies. You have to, you know, do certain things um, that are going to build your resume to in your CV so that when somebody looks at that, they're going to say, we, we want them in there. And then you also have to make a certain type of work and understand the quality of work that you're making, um, subject matter, etc. cetera. So um, I just think it's super important to recognize where you're at in the ecosystem because there is truly an ecosystem in the art world. And if you don't know where you're at, you're going to be swimming upstream and then you're going to be very disappointed. One of, the, one, you know, one of the things I tell a lot of my artists or any, anyone around, I say this, you know, do you want to make $50,000 a year as an artist. And this is maybe just if you're selling art through galleries, I would say the majority of artists are going to be selling art through galleries. In my opinion, you have, you have a really high elite who are in the blue chip galleries and then a high elite who are going into the museums, but the vast majority are actually selling through galleries or through a liaison. Um, and the question is then again, look, look around your, look around your studio add up all the, you know, the work you have, and then see what that equates to. Most people would say it probably doesn't even equate to $50,000, for example. And if you're going through a gallery, they're taking 50% of that. And then you have to pay taxes. So you may be making $20,000 on $50,000 worth of inventory. So, and then you have to worry, think about price points, all those types of things. Again, it's, it's doable, you know, I work my butt off and I, I crank out a lot of work and I try to keep price points at a certain, certain uh, point that I know I can sell within Cincinnati. And, you know, it's very important to understand those types of things. So um, for me, understanding the wide web and the ecosystem of the art world is very important. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned Cincinnati specifically because that has something to do with this geography matters. Uh, the blue chip galleries you talk about, you know, those are situated on the coasts. And uh, I would be interested to hear um, everyone talk about that awareness of what Cincinnati um, offers um, and how we have to work accordingly uh, in terms of our audience and connecting with the people who are um, interested in our work. How do we do that where we are? Yeah, and anyone can answer. I mean, I think artworks plays a big part of this. I think, you know, if you're interested in getting your name out there, if you're interested in, you know, widening, widening your network, then partnering with artworks on either designing a mural or being a teaching artist on a mural or just, you know, joining the mural studio, that is a fantastic way to meet new artists, to establish your name, to get such great experience to put on your resume or your CV. Um, also, I think, you know, I lived in Denver. I spent a lot of time in New York City when I was living in Connecticut. There's different cities for different things. And, you know, Cincinnati has such a vibrant art scene, such a vibrant public art scene, which is fantastic. And then, you know, if you don't feel like this is the city for you after you finish school, there are so many other places you can go and find the correct fit for you. But I hope you realize that Cincinnati really is a very great place to be for the arts. That's a pretty good segue, I would say. I mean, I I left, so I mean, but I'm back. So I mean, I like it's, I, you know, what I mean, I, I I can attest to say like there is. I didn't leave to stay away forever. I mean, a lot of creatives, a lot of 
a lot of creatives. I mean, Ohio's known for so many artists in so many different industries from music to, you know, muralists to, you know, painters to illustrators to animators to filmmakers to actors, actresses, like everyone, right? So um, a lot of the thing is you leave, you, you go, you stay. And my biggest thing when I left was to come back. I mean, that was a goal of mine from the jump. And I think that was also a testament to that drive. I think I knew that early on too, that yes, I'm gonna go away and it may be for a while. It may be for, I, I don't know, but eventually I'm gonna come back and I'm going to implement the things that I've learned in these places that they tell you that you have to go to so that you feel like you don't have to go there and you can do it right where you're at or close to where you're at. Um, so, I mean, I think it is important to travel, I mean, as well and, and get cultured because there's so much here, but I think what makes you a better artist is the more that you know, and the, the more that you know, it comes in with your experiences and in order to experience things, you have to do things, right? So just going out, I mean, to build a network, yes, art works, but like being out, going, meeting people, finding art fairs, finding flea markets, finding, you know, dance clubs, finding, you know, whatever the game nights, um, you know, all these different things that are going on in, amongst the city. These are places where like-minded individuals are going to be. And that's where you should be in those rooms so that you can speak and that you can network and you can, you know, meet other people because you know, that six degrees of separation is you never know who you, who you might know, if that makes sense. Did you want to add to that or ready for the next? Cool. So um, we did talk about this, you know, with the, your job at Toyota um, and the realization that you, that you had to not do that anymore. Right? And, you know, for medical reasons, but also uh, emotional and spiritual reasons, you were done. Um, I would love to hear Cameron and Niall uh, talk about the others, the other things that you've done that have very little to do with art, or if they do, it's not obvious, and these sort of circuitous path that we sometimes take, um, and we think that we maybe are going in the wrong direction, but we will eventually use everything that we've learned. Can you talk about some of the unconventional, non-art or non-creativity related things that you have benefited from? Um, so like earlier I was saying in LA for, you know, money, you gotta, obviously it's a very expensive city and I was a student as well and you have to find ways to make money out there. And one of the things I did was, you know, become a, a host at a, a restaurant in Hollywood. And one thing led to another where I went from a host to a server to a bartender, um, which led me to being able to manage the bar and, and kind of be there in a, in a you know pretty big role in a, in a, as a at a young age and one that allowed me to experience the service industry and that I say all the time I think everybody should have to work in the service industry at least one time or spend a week in the service industry or or something because it'll make everybody a better person period um, so I think working one in the service industry was a, an eye opening to interaction with people and again just bumping into anyone and everyone especially being in Hollywood I mean I was a good space to be in and I was able to be pulled out of that space and was given some really great opportunities out of it um, and so I mean I guess that was one big one and and that segues into everything else and then moving here you know not really knowing what exactly we were going to do outside of owning a design agency um, you know I find myself being a person who's aware of my community and aware of, you know, the things that are going on in the world. And, um, you know, around the pandemic time, it was big on self-protection and protecting the home and protecting your family. Um, so once I moved here, um, one, I grew up in that. My father was law enforcement. And, and so I kind of grew up in this juxtaposition of, experiences outside of the home and experiences in the home and around you know his work environment and so um, I've always had this sense of direction when it came to protecting my family and and it led me into working as a firearms instructor um, which was a completely pivot away from anything arts related or creative 
Um, and I went down that path because I had this urge and this drive to educate the people in my community who I felt weren't getting the same type of education uh, in that industry as others that didn't look like us. Um, and I noticed that by being a, a um, you know, a salesman in, in one of the shops and just noticing how everyone who looked like me or something like me was being pushed in my direction or pivoted to my direction. And, and it made me take on this role of being like, you know what, if that's going to be the case, again, I'm going to do as much research. I'm going to get as, as much as well versed in this as possible and as, as knowledgeable as possible so that when people do come to me, I can provide them with the proper education and knowledge that goes into, um, what it is that firearms are and protecting yourself and, and that education that goes um, with anything that comes with that. Um, so I think that's a testament to my drive. I just think that was something that I felt was necessary and took that on and still was able to segue that into being a creative and that networked me in, a, in another way that I, that I didn't you know think was possible and learned a lot about myself and that experience and about others as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's really what, um, <laughs> how things can kind of happen in your world that you, you know, you couldn't expect, but you know, if, if you feel it in your heart that you should go with it, you know, I, again, it goes back to like trusting yourself and believing in yourself that whatever you're doing is for a good cause and for the right reasons. And don't let anybody, you know, deter you from doing so and push you away from doing so as long as you know it is exactly for a good reason and, and, and it's healthy and it's positive for yourself and for the people around you. And that if you don't have a degree in something, that doesn't mean that you can't pursue, that you can pursue Absolutely. it, right? So um, it's this um, sort of larger embrace of skills, life skills and problem-solving skills that can apply to so many different things. I would like to go back to the service industry um, part that you mentioned. If you haven't had a service industry job, I highly recommend that you get one just for a little bit. And you will learn so much about yourself. You will come out stronger. You will come out a better worker than you ever were before. I got my first job at 14. I was washing dishes at a seafood restaurant. That is not fun, guys, okay? Uh, that came with another job at their coffee shop, the same owners. So I was working till midnight at the restaurant, waking up and opening the coffee shop at 6 a.m. I was doing this from 14 to 16. I, at the end of it, was covering manager shifts. I was bussing tables. I was serving. I was counting the drawers. I was closing up. I was doing the orders. I was doing everything because I was just watching and waiting for my opportunity because I wanted to get out of those sinks. They were gross. Um, after that, I had a moment, I said, I don't ever want to do this again. And I knew I wanted to work in fashion and I lived in a very small town in Connecticut, not an option. I'm talking like 3000 people max. So I went to my high school. I said, I'm going to intern in New York city. I'm going to leave school at 11 o'clock and take the train in. This is what I'm doing. And they said, okay, figure that out. So I interned um, in New York city for two years while I was in high school, as well as the summers got really valuable insight into the industry, realized maybe it wasn't what I wanted to do. I still decided to go to school, but focus more on the marketing and management part of it because I figured I could translate that into other um, industries if I needed to, rather than going into design, which was a little bit harder to transfer, but still possible. Um, so I've been really lucky to work in jobs that I feel super passionate about since then. Uh, I was working with Rock and Do's, which is a like Airbnb for touring bands. We were taking off, things were going so great. We were booking big time artists. Pandemic hit, touring stops. Okay, so I have to get creative. I started selling cars. Um, I was selling Jeeps, which I love Jeeps. I have a Jeep, so I was passionate about it, but that's also a tough um, career, a tough industry. So that didn't last too, too long. And then when I moved here, I was working in solar, which again, I was passionate about it. I was like, you know, really driving on the, we're saving the planet part of it, but it doesn't really, you know, it's not, it's also not a glamorous industry to be in um, until I found Artworks, which uh, is just amazing. And, you know, since I was 14, I've 
the mo the least amount of jobs I've had are two at a time. The most amount of jobs I've had are six at a time. So, you know, if you're passionate, you find your opportunities, you make your opportunities, whether that's, you know, interning, job shadowing, helping out on the side, or just creating a role for yourself and doing it. You know, so so in general, more than likely, um, statistically, you're going to have to get a job. But at the same time, you're also an, an artist. So, you know, the way that I always uh, approach that is, one, everything is temporary, okay? That's just how it is. Everything's temporary. Uh, that's the mindset that I take. And then the second one is try to work a job that maybe is only – uh, three days a week like I, I try to take a, if I did take a job it'd be like three days a week ten hours a day and then the other four days you can make art and the reason you want to do that is you want to make sure you're always making art and showing it because if you do start selling that's a great big bump in your salary and if you're not making that work though it's not going to happen so ideally if you can either work part-time or like you know longer days for sh for less days and then make your make your art, um, you know, the other days, and start to try to keep showing it. Um, again, I just think that that's a good way to try to keep your art career going while also, um, you know, having to work because working full time just Monday through Friday can be very very difficult on your art career. I mean, it's possible when you're younger you can really push through, but the older you get, it gets a little bit harder. So, um, yeah. Um, I'll just add to that really quickly before we go to Q&A, which you're going to participate in via the microphone, by the way. Uh, but I also sold cars for a year, and uh, I sold sobs. Weird. It's weird. But, uh, <laughs> but I committed to do it for a year because um, I knew that I probably wouldn't end up loving it, but I thought one year is a good amount of time to try it out. And the benefit of that was becoming really comfortable handling large sums of money and not feeling weird about it. Uh, and then I gladly walked away from the job <laughs> after a year. You can sell a car. You can sell anything, though, especially if you don't really know anything about cars, which was my situation. I just, you know, found my angles. I figured out who I was good with and what I was good at. Um, but that's another job that if you have a chance to do it, I recommend just for the learning experience. And then I'm going to transition out into the audience to take some questions. However, what I'd like to leave this portion with is um, we are all conditioned to say yes to a lot of things. And you're compelled to say yes to a lot of things with your assignments and uh, these invitations to do things. How do you say no and why? That's a good question. <laughs> I think my wife would uh, <laughs> challenge me on that because sometimes, you know, sometimes I have to, you know, for example, if, if, um, if I have a house payment and I don't have the money, sometimes I just say yes because, well, I feel like it's an opportunity I have to, where if I feel like I'm flush with cash, I may, I, you know, I may say, no, I'm going to stick with you know, uh, just making my own vision come to fruition. Again, that's always my main thing is to have my own vision come to fruition. So it can be tough when you don't have the money to say no, but um, you know, ideally, you know, your vision and your unique talent is really what you really want to try and tap into because that's what the world needs, you know, more than anything. Not necessarily a corporate logo done or et cetera, et cetera. So if you can, if you if you can do your own, do it. But have a lot to say about this. I don't think I learned this until I became a mother um, where I was forced to say no a lot more than I like to. Um, but one thing I want you to do is think about your mental health. You know, if you're exhausted and you're just depleted, you're not going to put your best work out there, whatever that work may be. So, you know, saying yes may seem fun and may seem like the right thing to do. But if it, you know, puts you in a state to not create your best work, it's just not worth it. So please consider your mental health when always saying yes. I just say no. <laughs> I, I do. I, it was, this wasn't set up this way at all. Uh, I do. I really just say no. Um, I think it goes back into, again, for me, it's knowing yourself. Like, really, you know, I, I spend a lot of time deep diving and working on myself and being a a better person than I was yesterday. And so I think being hyper aware of myself allows me to 
n- know what my boundaries are and when my boundaries are coming. Um, and so I think, yeah, that, that heads up allows me to just say, yeah, nah, no, I'm, I'm good on that or put limitations on it. You know, that, that sounds amazing and I would love to do it, but I can only offer this much at this time or I can only do X, Y, and Z. Um, or we can circle back to it at another time when I feel better, you know, when my mental health is better, when, you know, life is financially better, when, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but follow, follow your passions for, cause sometimes it may not be financially sound, but it may lead to a super great opportunity, um, that you just might have to push you. I mean, I think that was one of my issues just kind of this morning was I had a, an obligation that I set myself for and I wasn't too sure if I was going to be able to go through with it cause I felt too busy and, You know, my partner and my mother both was like, you know, you said you were going to do it, commit to it, do it, because you never know what can come out of it. And I pushed through and I did it and I ended up networking with some pretty awesome people in the city that um, are in some pretty, you know, interesting and powerful positions within the arts in Cincinnati. So, um, you know, that was the connections that I felt like I would have missed, you know, had I just not done it or felt like it wasn't up to par with, you know, financially or up to par with, you know, just like my full passion at the time. Um, So, yeah. I mean, say yes to what makes sense to say yes to, but make sure that no is in your vocabulary as well. Okay, so I would love to put this microphone out into the audience. If we have some questions for our panelists. I know they're out there. Okay, think on it, think on it. Yes, please do use the microphone. All right, pass that down, please. So we're talking about this whole thing about like being an independent creative and stuff like that. I was wondering what you guys did for like promo for yourselves when you were independent and like how that might be different from how we would do it right now as artists in like the field or however you put it. I mean, cause we're old and things are different now. Um, I mean, social media was still very important when I was promoting bands and whatnot and doing a lot of promo activities. So it's changed now, you know, it's a lot more TikTok and video type content versus pictures and Instagram and Facebook isn't probably as important to you guys as it was back then, but the most important thing to do is talk and don't stop talking. Talk to everyone you can, get it out there. If you have something going on, tell everyone you know and tell them to tell everyone you know. Um, And I think that was where I found a lot of success is that I would find a way to weave things into conversations every single opportunity I got. I was gonna say I heard the same thing. I heard old, 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 old. Um, no, I think word of mouth for sure. I mean, for me, um, social media and everything was important. And like, I'm not so so much a front of the camera person, although looks may be deceiving. Um, I very much love to be behind the camera and, and kind of do that for other people. Um, and so I was just always wanting to be out and mingle and go to favorite my favorite restaurants or, you know, once I got of age, like my favorite bars and lounges and, you know, those things and just really placing myself in the right rooms. Um, I think that's my biggest and is and was always my biggest sense of promotion was like feeling good, dressing good, you know, looking good, smelling good, and placing yourselves in the right rooms that, you know, help you get noticed and people want to have a conversation with you and, and you know, go from there. Yeah, I, I think there's just, you know, there, you know, other than social media, I mean, I think what, what you said is the biggest thing. You can't be afraid to tell somebody what you want. Say you meet somebody, if I, if I meet somebody and I'm at a party, you know, I'll say, hey, my name is Evan Hildebrand. Um, I'm an artist, and, you know, um, and, I, and, I, and, I want to, and, I, and I work with interior designers to sell work. If you, if you know of anybody, let me know. 
And then I ask them a question, you know, to make sure that it's not just about me, but I, I'll ask them a question and try and dig into, you know, you know who they are as well. But, th you know, they don't know what you want them, you know, people want to know, oh, wow, yeah, I, I, I know somebody. Um, I, I'm glad you told me. I'm glad you told me that that's what you want. So, you know, don't be afraid to um, open up about what you what you want to do as a creative um, and tell people about it. You know, I think that's a big thing. Business cards are still not a lost art either. <laughs> like physical business cards um, are very important. I mean, I use a digital business card that somebody can like it's a QR code that can scan it and it takes you to all my information. Would you be surprised how many people that I pull that out and they're still like, uh, do you have a like an actual card? Because people want it's it's a sense of connection. People want to attach themselves to what to what you're doing. So handing them a physical card is a sense of an extension, right? So they can take that card and they can put that in their pocket and they can go back to that later. And it may not be right away, but it can be right in that moment where they can be out somewhere and somebody's talking about something and it sparks it'd be like, yo, I got this card from this guy, from this person that does so and so and so and so, let me go find it. So it's a sense of a spark as well that happens. So business cards. Business cards as well. It's a great opportunity to showcase your work, make it interesting, make it different, make it cool. Nothing was more boring than my car salesman business card. It was black and white, it said my name, it said Jeep, that was it. But working with artists, you know, make it a different shape, make it functional. You know, I got a business card one time that was a bottle opener. That's genius. You know, get creative with it. Okay. Is it okay? Um, my question is, as you're having all of these different jobs that you're talking about, you know, gaining all these experiences, I'm just kind of curious how you continue to feel like an artist making your work you know, while you're doing all these other things, like working in like a restaurant or a bar or something like that, like how you kind of hold on to your like artist identity, I suppose, and how you keep thinking in like an artist mindset. I mean, I mean if, if, if the art world is a very difficult thing to be in, okay? And to be an artist in this world is not easy. What you have to realize at this point is that if you decide to be an artist, this is not, oh, I'm going to do this for a year, two years. You know, I'm in this thing for the long haul. I'm in this for the rest of my life. I'll be making art, period. No matter what happens in front of me, if, if I have to work, if, you know, I have to work a full-time job, I'll come home at night and, try, and, and make art or think about it. Um, and I, all, I always try to get back to that, that full-time artist. For the last two years before I got this job, I actually, that's what I was doing. And so I've, I'm kind of fresh in that mindset. And then I was approached by Artworks to, for this job, and I just couldn't turn it down because I, it, was, it was just such a perfect position for me. But for the last two years, that's exactly what I was doing. I was just making art. Now, I, wasn't, um, I was taking on some weird jobs in the art market, like I said, making a, a, a hang glider or doing things um, that were – just sculptural items for businesses, et cetera, but it was still in the creative field. And um, yeah, to, I mean, to keep your creativity on, you, you just have to make time for it, no matter where you're at and what you're doing. I think it's, it's important to make sure you're making time for it. It's, that's the biggest thing. And always try to get back to that, um, that place where, you're, again, you're making your own work. I would say find other things to do, like find hobbies, find things unrelated to arts. I think for me, I, I video games, you know, is yes, there's an art element to that. But if that's not what you're doing as an artist, like if you're not a video game designer or something like that, like find find ride a bike. Um, start a pickleball team. I don't know. That's what they do now, right? Um, uh, <laughs> oh, it's us that would do the pickleball. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, I don't, basketball, find, you know, like find, just find something that like you can feel good about and passionate about in yourself that's just a release. That's just like, you know, I just, I'm going to do this because I'm just doing this. It's not because I'm trying to make money. It's not because I'm, 
trying to turn this into a career. I'm not, you know, it's not because I, like, someone's telling me to. I'm, you know, trying to fulfill an obligation of a parent, like, any of that. Something that's for you, that you chose, that makes you feel good, that you can do whenever you want to do it. I've worked with so many artists and creatives at different stages. And, you know, if you want to be an artist full time, that's fantastic. Can you pay the bills? And if you can't, which, you know, starting off is a lot harder, then you can remove the money part of it and have a job to get the money to, you know, allow you to create and allow you to move forward in that aspect. And so being able to put it into two different categories, like I do this to get money to move forward. I do this to make art because I'm passionate about it. And I want to do it full time. Like, you know, don't be afraid to put things in different boxes. Um, so... First, I just wanted to thank you for all the valuable information and your time here. I've really enjoyed listening to this and talking. Um, being in the art world is very scary, and it's good to have people come and talk to us. Um, as far as like galleries go, my dream is to have at least one show in a gallery, like a big one, super detailed. Um, I know I'm not going to get there right away, of course, but what is like the first step to start getting out there in that track? Because I know you guys were talking about like different tracks and things of that sort, um, just as far as like galleries go. Thank you. Um, so I, I started off showing at coffee shops, which I think is a great, a great way to do it. Um, in Cincinnati, there's a really good one called Red Tree Gallery. They've got two, two galleries now, one in Oakley and one in um, downtown, actually. And, the down, and they both have really nice spaces to show. Um, it, it's important to show at those types of venues to start. In fact, when I showed, when I, when I, one of my first shows was when I, when I had it in um, Oakley, uh, there's a there's a there is a furniture store high-end furniture store called voltage across the street Where the owner happened to come over liked my work, and then I'm showing in voltage <laughs> so um, You know and I had a relationship with them where I sold art So don't just say all oh, because it's a coffee shop. I shouldn't show my work um, You know, I mean it probably is maybe good to be strategic about which ones you're showing at, you know You know certain areas may have clientele that are you know maybe buying more but I think two things the harder I worked and the more I showed the more I sold I mean it was just simple simple as that and so um, when I was in those modes of, of showing and and um, working I, I sold more work um, when it comes to just galleries really you really want to start to think about like series of work you want to be able to flesh out a whole series of work um, that's cohesive um, and, and continue to do that over, over the years. Take your time with it. I, you know, it might take you a year to make a whole series of work um, and, and just make the absolute best work that you can. Uh, another thing is you really want to think about, so that we'll, say you start getting outside the city with galleries. You know, there's a very big difference between the type of work that say a city gallery is going to want compared to say like down in Naples and Florida <laughs> where, you know, they really want certain color palettes and, and it, it, things like that. So, um, ideally this is just my opinion. If you can visit the gallery, um, you know, you got to remember when you're, when you're with a gallery, they're not only working for you, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not only working for them, they're working for you and you want to make sure you're able to have a good rapport with the people who are there etc and you want to make sure one of the things too is that your work is for one fits within their catalog and you and, and you start to you really want to start to think about those kinds of things does my work fit in here and then for two is there another artist in here that looks just like my work because they may not want to take it right i mean so you want to think about those types of things as well um i you know ideally you do want to have series of work, I think, um, in a variety of sizes and, 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 and pricing, I think is a good way to start. I have something to add to that as well. If you want to be in a gallery, then be get yourself in a gallery now, meaning go to shows, talk to people, talk to people that work at galleries, try to work at a gallery yourself, you know, talk to artists that have shown in galleries, you know, figure out which gallery would be your dream gallery and see how you can get involved, whether it's just attending shows, whether it's, you know, maybe they have an opportunity for you to be an apprentice or an intern or an assistant or anything like that. Um, so really just, you know, if your goal is long term, you can still start working on it step by step now. I, I have an approach to that too. start 
create what I've seen, especially in Los Angeles, I've seen is start do your own show. Be your own gallery. Find a event space or a space that you can rent for the night and showcase your work. Do have a series, put it you can share the work with you and a friend and do a co show or host your own work. Invite your peers out, invite the city out. Um, and curate your own events. And then from there, you also have a sense of a resume and a talking point for galleries that you can say, hey, like I've curated my own shows. This is what my art looks like. This is the attendance of my shows. Like I have a presence in the art field. So like just you doing it and showing the initiative of renting a space and putting your art up for a night with some good music and, you know, your peers is uh, it goes a long way. And also taking advantage of DAP's resources along these lines that have been mentioned just this evening. Right? <laughs> One more question and then we'll wrap it. Yep. Yes, because uh, Cincinnati's most famous gallery has an opening right now. Oh, fantastic. Solway Gallery. Solway Gallery yeah. has an opening. All right. One more question. I'm going to take it from you. Here. Go this way. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question kind of has to do with like burnout. Um, I feel like especially now, but like always, there's always been a big like hustle culture, um, like in any field, but like especially in like the art field, I feel like there's this sense that like you have to do what you're doing, but then like do it times 10 while also still like being able to financially support yourself and also like getting like an education. And like, I don't know, I think my question for you guys is like, how do you combat like the burnout, but also like combat this like ideology within like the society around us of like, you have to be better when you're putting in your best, I guess. And I, I think I can speak to that as far as even just seeing it on, a, on the next level of like living in LA young. I mean, every it's beautiful outside it's always sunny it's palm trees everyone's moving and hustling buzzing and making money and being creative and entertainment this and entertainment that and um you do i mean there's there's really no way to avoid the burnout or avoid feeling like you need to be gone all the time um the only thing that you can do really is just realize that like everything moves at your time as far as like your goals and your passions um no one else can determine that there's not like your path is written for you and as long as you kind of follow your path and you continue to take the steps necessary to reach your goals there's no length of time in which that that can happen um i mean i'm still i've accomplished a lot and i'm proud of the things that i've been able to do but i feel like i still haven't reached my actual goals yet i'm still in that phase of like reaching my the, the true goals that I have. And I think there's realizing that there's no sense of it has to happen right now. So it doesn't really matter if people make you feel like you got to be working and doing this and doing that. It's like, do what's healthy for you mentally, physically, spiritually, and know that like your time's going to come when your time's going to come, as long as you're putting in the work necessary for your opportunities to arrive because you create opportunities, opportunities don't create themselves. I think also don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's help with the business side of it. And, you know, there's always going to be someone out there that wants to do your spreadsheets. Like, that's where I thrive. I want to do that part. Um, or maybe it's a high school student that you know that wants to see what you're doing and kind of shadow you, or intern for you. Like, it sounds crazy, but it's possible. You know, maybe it's, you know, stepping back from some things in your life and just saying, you know, I have too much on my plate right now. I need help in this area. And, you know, art is so passion-fueled and so personal. The last thing you want to do is burn yourself out and have that fire go out. So just always try to remember to set realistic goals and then also check in with yourself every once in a while. Be like, is this too much? Am I overwhelmed? Have I said yes to too many things? And don't be afraid to have to walk it back sometimes. Very good, very good advice. And um, one of the other things that I think is, is important as a studio artist is to get into a, um, a mindset that where the process is almost more important than the outcome. And if you're enjoying that process, you almost become, I would slightly say addicted to that, to that process where you're in this, you're in this moment where, you know, you four or five hours passes and you don't even realize that four or five hours have passed. If you can develop that type of um, workflow and, and understanding of, of, of the work, it doesn't feel like you're burning out as much. Um, 
compared to say like, you know, uh, you have a deadline and you're just making work just like a, a, a as a hustle, which has to happen, but try to get into a, a flow where it's more about the process and your understanding w with it than it is the outcome. I think that's our stopping point right there. We could go on and on. Um, this is such good advice. Thank you for sticking around. Really appreciate it. Thank you again, Sue.